three, two, one. Welcome to episode one of Crosstown Cardboard. I'm Carmine. You see Carmine's cards if you're watching on our YouTube. And that's Craig, my good buddy, New York City Sports Cards. And as you heard, the lovely woman intro us. We're from opposite sides of New York City. I'm from Westchester County, New York, now living in Southern Oregon. Craig is from on Long Island, which is an important distinction, which is the other side of New York City. And I'm a sports broadcaster slash news anchor here in Southern Oregon. Craig is a public high school teacher in the New York City School District at a sports and business high school. Also starting up the now legendary card club, which I'm sure we'll get into. And we want to thank you guys and ladies for trying us out. We want to appeal to everybody, uh, collectors, investors, flippers. We feel like we offer something for everyone. And uh, thanks for giving us a shot. And Craig will explain where we stand and why we think we should have a podcast about sports cards. Yeah, I'm very impressed you got the on Long Island. Uh, that mistake gets made often. But I as Carmine sure. mentioned, my name is Craig. And, you know, we we connected uh, through Facebook a while back. And I think we just kind of clicked. And, you know, we get along so well because we're just, I think you're uh, your everyday collector. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so cross down cardboard, you being from one side of New York City, me being from the other. We're kind of just trying to expand different interests and uh, appeal to a lot of people. Um Cross down Carbar, the uh, the alliteration, Craig Carmine, it's just a match made in heaven. But yeah, we uh, we want to just I think create this to talk about our experiences and connect to the everyday collector. You know, for us, we're we're not full time into cards. We love this, and both of us have been doing this for quite a long time. But you know, we have uh, regular jobs. You know, you being a broadcaster, me being a teacher. But I think what makes us unique is sports cards ties really a lot into what both of us do professionally. So we're going to get into that in future episodes, I'm sure. But, you know, you and I, I think we dip our toes in everything, right? We, uh, we consume content for sure. You and I collect uh, differently. We have our own lanes and we're going to get into that as well. You know, we do shows, which I'm excited to hear about the one you just did. We collect, we flip. So, you know, we, we do a little bit of everything. And I think that helps, you know, our audience because we, uh, we want to be relatable and equitable for everyone. You know, whether you're a seasoned collector or you're brand new, you can get something out of this. If not, just enjoy some stories about uh, sports cards. And we want to tell stories past um, what's going on in our uh, collecting journey right now and really just have fun. You know, you and I get along, so we're going to have fun. And uh, I hope other people enjoy this as well. And as our good buddy, the sports card therapist, Rob Gerard, who thanks to Rob for helping us get all this figured out behind the scenes. He always says, if it don't apply, let it fly. So if it doesn't apply to you and you're collecting, then, you know, don't take it too serious. I mean, we joke around. Uh, we collect different styles of things. You see the Messi and Ronaldo card behind you, the U.S. men's soccer team. We're both Knicks fans, for better or worse. And, you know, Bird and Magic are two of my guys. I also like golf with Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus, which we'll get into. Um, but I asked Rob, I said, what if it do apply? And he was like, well, I don't really know. I said, well, touch the sky, maybe like a Kanye West type of thing. But... um, but Craig, can you explain our first deal that we did together that then led to us, you know, becoming friends, becoming New York buddies and then talking for like a year. And then, you know, I was like, hey, why don't we start a podcast? Because we got along so well and we were constantly talking. But it all started with that first deal that we had. Yeah. And I, uh, I went back into the archives to figure that out. It was early January, it was like January 3rd, 2022. And I would say around that time, like last year, I was very into the, the buying and the flipping and the trading and even mm -hmm. for like just little margins here and there. And, you know, life gets in the way you got to slow down a little bit, but you were uh, right in, the, in the, the whirlwind of all that. So we got connected because you had a, a Michael Jordan uh, rookie sticker. I believe it was mm -hmm. in a PSA five, I want to say. Yes. And I had this Kevin Durant encased auto in a BGS nine out of 10. So right around the time when we connected, I was uh, on the finish line of making a trade using that KD autograph. And okay. it was a Kevin Durant autograph and it was this Peyton Manning sticker autograph in a BGS 9510. And I was going to trade those two for five cars. And I'm looking over them now. It was a LeBron refractor, a Barry Sanders autograph, an Oscar Robertson autograph, a David Wright autograph, and a Dak Prescott camo prism. And 
I was about to make the deal and I'm like, you know what? I'm not feeling this deal, but I kind of already put the offer out there. So all he needed to do was give me the handshake emoji and it was good to go. So <laughs> I was, but I was regretting it. So I'm like, yo, come on. And, and I even went back to the messages and I'm, and I'm like, yo, you got to make this decision quick. And I, yeah. I had just met you via Facebook chat, but basically uh, you kind of sniped our deal at the last second where I ended up trading that Kevin Durant and case autograph and some cash for your Michael Jordan sticker. And because I didn't quite want to do that other deal, I quickly jumped on ours. I raised my cash offer. That was the only deal you and I have ever done, but we stayed in touch since then. Yeah. What was going on with that part of the deal? Because originally, you know, it was, it was like you offered the KD, which we valued between like four and 500 and 150 cash. I think it was around a $500 value. And 150 cash. Sorry, my girlfriend's cooking uh, dinner. I don't know if you hear that beeping in the background. But the show is hot so far. So maybe yeah, that's what, nice. what's setting off the smoke alarm. Uh, we're, we're a little corny, too. Cross down cardboard with a side of corny, but uh, which is not a bad thing. So anyway, we had the deal going. You said 150 cash on top of the KD for the Jordan PSA 5 Fleer sticker rookie. And I said, ah, I don't know. And then all of a sudden you came with 350. And I was like, I think I just said deal right away. But how did you raise it from 150 to 350 so quick? Um, you actually said deal, all exclamation points. Uh, sorry, all caps on the deal. But it was originally, I offered the KD 150. I upped it to three. You said 350. We met in the middle of 325. And I was going through a moral dilemma because I really did put that offer out there to the other person. But, yeah, I mean... You know how it goes. Handshake emoji or it's a, it's a no-go. So we never we never got that far. So I was able to back out at the last minute. And uh, yeah, look at this friendship that it turned into. I know. Now we have this podcast. So I wanted to dive into a little bit more, which that deal was great. And, that, and I was like, oh, this guy's fair. And plus, you even called me on Facebook Messenger, which I thought was a nice personal touch. And that kind of ties into how both of us deal with the sports card hobby. I mean, of course, we love collecting. You have a personal collection that you won't touch. My personal collection is mainly like one Larry Bird auto and a bunch of Knicks autos. You have something to show? You want to pull up? Oh, I've got plenty to show, but we'll get there. Okay, okay. So, you know, that kind of ties into our personal nature of dealing with sports cards. I mean, we've done deals. I'm sure you've done deals with everyone from seven years old to 70. And so hopefully this show can be something where we can connect people. And I mean, you're a teacher, so you're in education. My mom was a college professor for 40 years of psychology. So I'm kind of like into the whole psychology of the deal and, you know, people learning from whatever level we're at, which I would say, you know, kind of middle of the road. But um, I feel like that's one of the things that we bring to the table as far as the personal side of collecting, the stories behind the cards. And I mean, you were even on the news as a little kid opening up packs and getting cool cards. So I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on what side of cardboard that we want to get to in this podcast. I was looking for the card that I was on the news for, but I'll, I'll pull it up later. Okay. Um, I think it's what you said, the, uh, the storytelling element out of it. I've collect. I've, I've memories from when I was a kid collecting cards. I have cards that I've owned for over 15 years, and you know that ties to a lot of memories. And I think a part of that is kind of lost when you keep hearing about like what cards are going up, how much stuff are worth, the flip, the margins. Like, don't get me wrong, we both are involved with that as well. But I do think an element that's lost and kind of you know the essence of what cards were built on were memories and stories. I mean, here's just an example, right? Let's we'll just jump into the cardboard. Here's a Here's an Ichiro card from his playing days from Hilo when he was in Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the reprint from 2001. Um, I'm not going to go into that whole story, but if you look on my Instagram, I have a lengthy post about it. But this card is worth, you know, whatever it, it's worth. And I'd probably make a nice margin flipping it, but I got this on my honeymoon. So this very card right here is tied to a memory for life. And I think tying these certain just pieces of cardboard to to memories and connections and interactions and trades is 
you know, we, we could talk about that forever. And yeah, obviously the value is a part of it as well, right? We want our collections to be worth something, but why can't it be a combination of the two, right? Good memories, players we care about, but we're, we're also investing. I'm, I'm, I'll be the first to admit that I look at my collection from an investment standpoint as well. Totally agree a hundred percent. And, uh, you know, and this is something where, oh, I'm having a green screen malfunction. There we go. If I was in the, the, uh, weather center of my, uh, studio, it would this would never happen. But like, you know, I think sports cards can be partially a thing where you can pat yourself on the back. Like, I don't know about you, but every deal I have, I'm like celebrating, like, you know, like tiger, Oh, making a, a putt in a major, you know, and if you look at this, I got this from Dave over at extraordinary cards. And I mean, that is not an understatement. He has some extraordinary cards and he does uh, a lot. He does a lot and he posts and I, hopefully we can start. I mean, I know for a fact, we'll start having guests maybe come episode four or five. Once we get ourselves established and kind of share a little about a little bit about what we're about. And uh, maybe we'll have Dave on. I know for a fact Rob wants to come on, sports card therapist. Um, but, you know, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, you'll see this Tiger Woods SP Authentic Rookie Auto numbered out of 274, which they also have a 273 version, BGS 95. And I have a 7.5K sticker on it as far as my asking price. And it just felt like a moment of accomplishment when I got that one from Dave over at Extraordinary Cards. And I know, you know, on your your backdrop there, you have a Michael Jordan PSA 8 Fleer rookie. And so that's we're going to we're going to definitely mainly keep it about the cards. And it really doesn't matter, like the value of the cards. It might be a $50 card. It might be a malfunctioning green screen. It might be a seven and a half K tiger woods card but it's it's each card comes with a different story and a different reason why we like it and uh one of those is continuing to level up but another one is just like the cool factor like i'll throw one more out there this jack nicholas uh that i recently got it's i have it at two and a half k i feel like that's around what it should go for PSA 8, and if you're watching on YouTube, again, Crosstown Cardboard, you can see. But it's a Barrett & Co. 1971, and this is the first ever card that Jack Nicholas was printed on back in 1971. And some consider... Give me the knowledge. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drop it on you. So this is a London Tobacco Company, and it's the first ever card, like I said, Jack Nicholas was on, the Golden Bear. Still has the most majors, 18 to Tigers 15, so you can argue... Who's the best? But it's his true rookie. And on the back, it says he's often seen on the TV screens, <laughs> just like me, as he is an exciting player to watch. Big hitter of the ball, if you can read that on YouTube. And so um, just a cool card with a cool backstory. And that's uh, that's a couple of the, the golf cards that I recently got in the, probably the past month. Um, but yeah, what's, I mean, I what's feel so like... fun about it? about what? what what's just, just the hobby in general and the variety of cards out there is that that makes you feel a certain type of way, right? To yeah. me, like I don't I don't know much about it. Just like I have plenty of cards here that like I just look at my home like, yep, this is mine. I enjoy this. It might mean nothing to you. So when you talk it out like that, when you hear people say collect what you like, it's it's simple, right? You know, the, it's like the old phrase, if everything, if all your value goes to zero, which certainly we hope doesn't happen, well, you still like what you have. And I was thinking about that, too, because I know that's like an extremely common phrase. If everything goes to zero, I still like these cards. But I was thinking a step further. Not only collect what you like because you like it. And if everything goes to zero or if your cards, you know, lose some value, you will be fine with it or not fine with it, but more fine with it because nobody likes to lose money. Not only that, you'll be able to sell cards you like better. I mean, if I can, like I was just at the Portland, Oregon show, like I said, I'm from Southern Oregon or I'm from New York, but I live in Southern Oregon. And up in Portland, if somebody asked me about a card, I genuinely like that card 
I don't even have to sell them on it. I just tell them what I honestly think about it. Like, for example, a Knicks fan came up and he was looking at a Walt Clyde Frazier, our boy right there next to Bernard King to the left of your shoulder. And there you go. And so he came up, he's like, he's wearing a Knicks hat and we're just talking about the Knicks and we're talking about how, you know, we got to get rid of Julius Randall, which, you know, I don't know how you feel about Julius. I like him, but he's very similar to RJ Barrett with a lower ceiling. Anyway, we were, we don't want to get too much into the Knicks, but we were talking about the card. And so we just started having a conversation. I was like, yeah, that's a cool card. You know, and I'm not lying. I'm not having to sell them on anything I don't like, or I'm not having to, you know, even sell anything. I'm just honestly having a discussion about a card that I like. And so I feel like that's another reason why collect what you like, you know, like I'm always doing Larry and Larry and magic and uh, collecting their cards because I like those guys. You know, I think that was the greatest one, two rivalry in basketball. And, uh, you know, they each have their opposite sides. And then you see the friendship just in this picture uh, behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, that they came to have. And so I feel like that's another reason to collect what you like, which we should talk about the upcoming World Cup a little bit, because you're you've been really going hard on the U.S. men's soccer team. Yeah. So you summarize pretty simply why you like Magic and Bird. They're two guys you enjoyed watching. Right. What's what's the reason that you collect what you collect? And I actually really wasn't a soccer card collector, I would say, until early 2022. So it hasn't even been a year. But I, I coach soccer along with teaching. I, I teach high school math and I coach soccer. So I coach at the high school level and I coach at the club level. So I'm, I'm around the field six, seven days a week. So naturally, also having played my whole life, even though I didn't really watch much growing up, that interest is becoming you know more and more all around me. So I've taken a liking to professional soccer. With that comes taking a liking to the U.S. national team. Like I'm around youth players. These youth players eventually become national team players. So I just feel like I'm kind of all in it. So naturally with that, I start liking, you know, the soccer cards more. Because the way I see it is if I'm going to be watching these players for the next decade, I might as well, you know, have their cardboard and invest as well. So just to give you... Like, here's one I picked up recently. This was a 30th birthday present to myself. It's a Erling Holland's Red Refractor out of 10. Nice. Second year. But if you look at his Red Refractor rookies from Topps Chrome Bundesliga, so that would be 2019, 2020. I mean, we're seeing cards in Gem Min upwards of 20K. So I picked this up. And you know what? I'm, I'm a math teacher, so I like to talk about numbers. I picked this up for uh, $750, straight cash. And it was a fun experience because I actually met someone about a 10 minute walk from my apartment uh, right at Central Park. So it was cool to, to do like an in-person uh, you know, uh, sale only in New York City. And I was on my 30th birthday party. And this is Erling Holland. I realized I didn't even introduce who it was. But I mean, if you are paying attention to any sort of sports news, this guy's absolutely tearing it up. And yeah, it's funny. I was talking to someone about buying the hype of a card, but I think it's different when it's not just hype. Like he's the real deal. So now I've got the short printed card out of 10 that I'll probably never get rid of, not only because I believe in him, but this was a 30th birthday present to myself. So now there's extra sentimental value attached to it. So how can I ever part with this? Yeah, that's going to be a tough one to, uh, to part with. And I agree with, you know, if you, if you're buying the hype, but you think somebody's the real deal, for example, I got a, uh, an Aaron judge national treasures, one of one auto, which I put in our Wolfpack group chat uh, with me, you, Amel Sarfani, uh, which is he, he, uh, you know, he's another podcaster, but we like to promote our buddies, you know, Ken mm-hmm. sports card lessons, uh, DJ sports cards, Dave and Rob sports card therapist. And so I bought the Aaron judge national treasures, one of one unlicensed because of baseball, you know, with tops and Bowman, yep. but it was still a one of one NT auto Aaron judge. So I bought it as he's on the home run pace. He probably had 30 home runs at that time, but you know, he's on pace and everybody's like, Oh, Roger Maris, watch out. AL home run. Is this the real home run record and all that? And of course we know now that he broke it with 62. And at the time it was just the hype, but I'm all about riding the hype while it's going up and selling while it's going up 
even though it might not be the absolute peak. So like I, I bought that Aaron judge for 500 sold it to a buddy in a bulk deal for a thousand. And then I saw it on eBay because he told me he listed. I'm like, listen, all more power to you. Like, I hope you get the most money you can. And I saw it sold for 2,300. Wow. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, I could have had 1300. Well, after eBay fees, maybe one grand more. And I'm like, but you know what? What if he didn't get it? What if he didn't get that record? And so I like to keep the money flowing if I'm going to be in that flipping range. And then I said, oh, hey, I, I hit him up on Instagram. I was like, oh, congrats, bro. Great. You know, so happy for you. And he's like, yeah, but the guy didn't pay. Hmm. Classic. Classic so eBay like, in the year 2022. Am I right? Well, that's another part of the risk. Now, what if by the time he relists it, the Yankees are eliminated from the playoffs? which neither one of us are rooting for. Well, you're, you like the Mets, so maybe, I don't know. Listen, it, it, it's, it's tough to time those things when you are selling a card. And listen, I don't really sell too much anymore because I'm, uh, I'm quite picky with what I pick up, and I really love yeah. what I pick up. So that's why uh, I don't want to sell it. But it's impossible to time the market. You can never go wrong while things are on the up. Right. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a, had a Steph Curry 2009 upper deck, not as regular rookie, which I think was card 234. His uh, first edition rookie in a PSA 10. Actually, might have also been card 234. And I remember I, it was last year before the finals, and I specifically ended that card on eBay on like a Sunday night, which would have been game seven of the Western Conference finals, which they had already clinched. So that card listed at this like one or two day period in between them winning the Western Conference finals and the finals, and ended uh -huh. up being like the highest sale of that card within probably like a six month radius, essentially. Um, use that to buy a uh, wife's uh, first anniversary gift. So there you go. Everyone's happy here. Priorities. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll drop one more on you with uh, getting lucky time in the market. I bought this Mac Jones. I think it was the absolute, the ones that have like the triple patches with the sticker auto. And I think it was numbered to like 99 or 49. It was a rookie, but it was a, either a player worn patch or non affiliated, which I usually don't like. But I bought it at a good price during the season last football season. So 2021 football season. And that's when the Patriots went on that eight game winning streak. But I bought it when it was around the third and fourth game that they had won in a row. And so I'm like, oh, they look pretty good. Like Bill Belichick, you know, this could be the next Tom Brady. You know, people think that, oh, he's filling his shoes because he had just gone to Tampa Bay. And uh, so I listed it on eBay during their win streak, knowing that they were going to play the Buffalo Bills on a Monday night game, which is the notorious game where they ran the ball like three times and still won. Mm -hmm. It ended the night after. So it was at the perfect hype. I think that was their eighth win in a row. And so I listed the Mac Jones and I'm looking at this thing. I'm like each game they're winning because I listed it for 10 days. By the time it sold, I had bought it for 400. It sold for 2200 because it was perfectly yeah. timed with that hype. And after eBay fees, I took home about 1900 So I had a $1,500 profit. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, that might not happen again. But just the fact that that can happen one time and kind of catapulted me into like starting that big wheel turning of buying, selling. And I knew it wasn't going to be like that you know, almost any other time. But I'm like, wow, this is incredible that you can bet on sports through sports cards and then sometimes hit it big. Yeah, there's, I mean, there, there's so many things I could say in response to that. And it's fun to get that victory, right? And I know for you, the cards are going right back or the money's going right back into the hobby, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, a lot of stories. Listen, we're going we're gonna to have a lot, lot of stories we could share. Like, that's a great story. I, I, I could tell you about the Michael Jordan that I got into. And I want this. I want this show to be about storytelling because I can't help but see news and drama going on around uh, the hobby. And we're not even going to get into that. We're not going to get it. We could talk about, like, prices. And obviously, I'm seeing stuff like shows are a little bit slower. Prices are going down. But even when there's the bad, there, you and I are always going to give – good positive stories just like fun interactions and um 
hopefully that gives some some people uh, something to listen to, even if you know things are a little stale for them in the hobby. We could always bring a light to it. Yes, we have a, a New York City light, and I'll just uh, since you mentioned the shows, Craig, why don't we? I know we we kind of feel like let our excitement take hold in episode one, which I want to get out to our probably very few listeners right now, but you know, that's okay. So I want to, and I'm holding up my green screen behind me, uh, which, which hopefully will, uh, I'm not, I'm not just celebrating above my head. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the technical element here, but and why to don't the I go listeners. through like a, huh? to the 10 listeners, we love and appreciate to the you. 10 listeners and maybe five viewers. So if you, you know, are listening everywhere, you can find your podcast on Crosstown Cardboard. You will not be deterred. But if you're watching, I really apologize, but we'll get it figured out. So why don't we go through like some recent shows that we've been to? Because um, I just came back from the Portland show, which was my first kind of big show, I'd say, you know, in a bigger city. And I sold about, like you said, we're not afraid to disclose numbers. I sold about $2,300 worth of cards and took in maybe another 500 in trade. And I'd say of those 2300 I probably a third was profit, which is right where I like to be. Like if I can hit like a third profit and keep that wheel turning, even if it's low, like even if I think I could sell it for more, I have no problem like giving somebody a decent deal because with the cash and trade deals that I usually like to do, I can get into stuff for cheaper. And it's just about, you know, jumping on the right deal. Like Warren Buffett always says you can in, in investing, which is kind of what we're doing as far as flipping, you can take as many pitches as you need to and then wait for the perfect home run swing, you know, and I listen to him because he knows a lot more than us. But here's a couple cards that I got on top of um, the sale numbers. So I got this magic innovation. It's a sticker auto, but it's out of 25. Took that in the like trade. Thanks, bro. I got this uh, uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. player worn out of 50, which I usually like game worn, but I don't know about you. I'm always more flexible if I'm taking trade and cash as far as what I get in trade. Like I want to like it, but if the trade makes sense value wise with the cash, I feel like I'm more flexible, especially than if I was spending straight cash to get a card. Um, listen, I'm going to, I'm, um... I'm definitely have become one of those snobs where now well, you're a I don't think I'm a single player one. No I mean, more we could player do, one. We could do an entire episode on that, but it's okay. sim- simple, simply for me, it was just the fact that I grew up and everything was game worn. So I can't yep. see it any other way. Like I, yep. I literally used to call these cards game pieces. Yeah. Like no, when, I'm I was, with you. when I was first introduced to Jersey cards, I, I called them game pieces and I tried to collect as many game pieces as possible because they only came one per like 24 pack retail box. And it was never yeah. even a question if it was game one because it's cool that that player actually wore in a game. But right. again, we, we can go into that. We can do a whole episode on that. Game worn, player worn, not associated. I'm sure, I'm sure we will. And that's one of the things that I usually look for. I was a little more lenient with trade with that one. Here's yeah. a Vince Carter. Mm. Uh, that's not on card. Usually I'm a stickler for on card and game used, but in trade, I don't know. I get a little more lenient. And then I got this really cool penny. This is on card origins at a 25 and you can see the price I have listed on it. Uh, Origins Underrated. Underrated. And I have the uh, bill Russell too, which I feel like I don't want to give away my whole collection right in episode one and, uh, you know, not save anything, but that's what I got. And I would say real quick before you jump into, uh, some of the recent shows you've been at. The most expensive card I sold was a $400 card, which you can see on at Carmine's Cards on Instagram. And it's a uh, all-star game from Las Vegas, which I'm pretty sure is in 2007. They gave out these cards like of the guys with on on playing cards, like because it was in Las Vegas, the gambling capital. And it was a PSA 8 Jordan it was only a pop 20, but the value went down recently. And so I sold it for at comps, which I'm always, I feel like if it's at comps, unless the recent comp is down or the guy got hurt, I'm fine moving that. But that was my most expensive card that I moved at the Portland show. And I have, you know, several four figure cards in my case and a lot more, you know, three figure cards above 500 bucks, but that was the most expensive. So I feel like between that 
$25 to $400 range was really where I made the most sales. Yeah. Cause you could find a lot of really cool things in that range. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, uh, we see a lot of these ultra modern on our feeds, but if you take, I don't know, from the year 2000 to 2010, there's a lot of brands, upper deck, Fleer, um, tops basketball, for example, that, aren't around anymore but those cards still exist that you could have at a much cheaper price um as far as shows it's been a while for me uh fall is a busy season for me coaching two seasons so the last show i was at i was set up at was the new york city show i never miss a home game can't do it the uh <laughs> the new york the new york city shows laz is the promoter to laz nyc on instagram he always brings out the best promoters the best crowds so uh that was fun for me because my inventory mostly being soccer, I was able to set up next to three of my soccer friends. And then there were two other tables next to us. So in a sport that's really kind of on the outside of, I guess, basketball mm -hmm. and football, it was cool to see it growing and having all these tables uh, next to me. You know what? The other stuff, it just doesn't interest me as much. I still collect basketball. So I'm always on the hunt for Giannis, but even then in particular, I like his autographs, his patches, uh, multicolored game worn stuff. My biggest takeaway from the show was patience. And this happens to me every show. And it applies not only to shows, but collecting and making moves. You know, I go the first three hours and I didn't really do anything. No trades, no sales, no nothing. And then you start to get discouraged. But you stick with it. And then by hour four or five, the deals start coming in and flowing. And I'm making moves. I'm making trades. My inventory is you know, re-upping. So just patience. And since then... I've been able to buy a few things from home, but I'm really enjoying what I'm having right now. Every once in a while, you'll go into the PC and I'll just, I'll just look at certain cards and like, yeah, I, I can't replace this. Like, I don't want to get rid of this. And I'm at a pretty good place where I like a lot of my stuff right now. I still have a full Zion case worth of inventory that I'm just waiting to set up at a show. But in the meantime, always looking on Instagram for uh, new stuff and I should be able to set up at a couple shows, November, December, especially around World Cup time which is what I've just been waiting a year for at this point. That's been part of my problem too, which is because I feel like I'm really liking what I have. So as far as like trades, it's getting a little bit tougher because like, I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to trade this card because I really like it. Like I just got an SGC submission back uh, nice. from my buddy, uh, Jack B nimble cards submitted it. And, uh, he brought it to the Portland show for me. And one of my 2014 prisms, uh, which I just love that set. This is the Wilt, which I just got uh, in another deal from a guy Red in Australia. Red prisms number? Yeah, out of 25. Nice. Number to 25. This is a like pop that. one on the Wilt. Color and match. The, Sucker for yeah. color match. Yeah, perfect for the color match for Philadelphia. And so it was the same thing with the Dame. And so I was like, well, I don't really want to trade this because it's, you know, a pop one. It's super cool. A Dame collector is going to love it. And this guy came up and he was, he was like, well, what do you think? He pulled out a Joe Montana game used, our favorite, patch auto out of 15, immaculate, big patch. And I was like, big patch. Okay. 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 It was a one color patch, though. But I was like, oh, OK. And I had been texting my buddy uh, Kalua cards on Instagram, huge Dame and huge Portland collector. And I met him in person for the first time at this show after doing deals online. And he said, um, I'm coming to get that card. And so I was debating, like taking it out of the showcase, but I never want to. He didn't he didn't say for sure, like I'll pay because I told him what I was asking. I said, I'm asking three fifty. And he didn't say for sure, like deal. So I was like, okay, let me keep this out because I'm not sure what's going to happen. So he, he comes up and he's like, to the other guy who was starting to get into talks with me, he's like, step away from my dame. And, <laughs> but he knew I that. Guy. He knew so. the other guy. But he um, came in and we made a deal. Um you know, we kind of negotiated a little bit, but it, he, we sold it for what I thought was a good price. Um, and uh, I don't want to say just because I, I don't, I haven't okayed it with him, but it was somewhere around what I was asking. And uh, 
but I just love giving that card to somebody who is going to put it away. First of all, and loves Dame loves the trailblazers and uh, you know, the in-person shows, I want to get to more. I wish I was in your and Rob and Ken's area in the Northeast. Yeah, like still you. back home. Yeah, we got but shows it's a little few and far between. Yeah. We're lucky. And I, I shows is where I do best. You know, that's, that's the essence of the hobby is going into shops and buying packs and trading with your friends, you know, flipping what we think of now. My dad told me he they used to play this game called flipping, whereas you would literally flip the cards, like the, the physical act of flipping, not, uh, not the, the the financial term that we know it to be right, uh, right. an old game called flipping cards, but I don't even know where I was going with that. But no, well, this... speaking of flipping, while well, you're flipping to me because now I'm talking, but boom. Um, boom, 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 broadcasting, quick on your feet, and back to you, Carmine. <laughs> yeah, yes, back to me in the studio. Actually, here, here's the mic right here. But uh, I did. Speaking of flipping, I did my first coin flip. Mm. Uh, for like, you know, we were like between 300 and 350 on a deal. And I, it was a guy from Montana of all places. He was in Portland for a basketball tournament with his kids. And I wanted to unite, strangely enough, magic and bird. He had a magic Johnson select auto out of 30. It was like rare year. It was pink. BGS 95. I had the bird in the same card, also a BGS 95 out of 30 pink, same year select. I want to say maybe 2014, 15, around there. And so I knew he had a strong reason to unite those two cards. And that's actually where I got the Penny and the Vince Carter in partial trade. So I was like, I really like 350 on top. There was also a D Wade auto out of 15 that I ended up selling before being able to show you guys. I wanted 350 on top. He was like 300. I was like, what about 325? He's like, well, let's flip for it. And I said, between 300 and 350? He was like, okay, cool. Yeah. And so we agreed. So it was in the air. I called tails. It ended up being heads. But I was still happy. For, like, I was happy to get 300 either way. I mean, I, it was still a deal I would take. It was good. So fun. I would have been over the move, uh, over the moon. But it was good fun. It was good fun. And I turned around with a smile and shook his hand. I said, great. I'm glad to get that card in your hand. I actually took a picture of him with both cards, holding him up with this huge smile, magic on one side, bird on the other side. And then a few days later, I'm doing a podcast with magic and bird on either side of me on the green screen. That's a sweet picture too. The, uh, the Celtics under there. Yeah. And I think that was in his... When he got, um, correct me if I'm wrong, some bird and magic lovers out there. It was either his last game or it was when he got inducted into the Celtics ring of honor and magic came out. And I think they had like, he's like, I need an undershirt underneath my uh, Lakers warmups. He's like, I can't go out there with no undershirt. And one of the Celtics uh, equipment people tossed him the Boston Celtics shirt. And then it just kind of, it, it, it encapsulates their rivalry and those two guys along with Peyton Manning. And now I'm getting more into golf. Um, those are guys I, I love and partially because almost everybody loves those guys and they're under, and I think they're undervalued. You can get great cards for cheap of all three, Peyton Manning, magic bird, and their values probably aren't going to change very much. Yeah. Like, uh, like I said, patience, if you're good holding those, they seem like a safe play. Um, but for this first episode, yeah, uh, I want to I want to wrap up with this because uh, I am I'm chaperoning a field trip tomorrow, and believe it or not, it sounds like a day off. These kids these kids are reckless, so I uh, I got to be in my A game tomorrow. But yes. what uh what are you looking forward to most about this podcast? You know how, how what why should people continue to tune in? That's a great question. Uh, if you made it this far, I want to say thanks for trying us out on Crosstown Cardboard because we're just two average guys, broadcaster, teacher. We love cards. We've loved it for a very long time. You know, we both been started collecting 20 years ago. I took some about 15 years off probably before jumping back into it a year and a half ago when my mom had hip replacement surgery and I was home for three weeks taking care of her. 
And uh, I just went through my collection and I said, man, I really love this stuff. And started on eBay, started buying and selling, getting into the Instagram, Facebook groups. And Craig's been going strong for at least 20 years. And um, so we just we truly love sports cards and love the connections made through them. I mean, we're good friends now because of cardboard. I feel like why should you keep watching? Just to enjoy the hobby with us. I mean, you know, and we'll interact with people who comment uh, on YouTube. I mean, I've helped, you know, mothers who write in on my Instagram and say, hey, I saw you're buying and selling cards. My eight year old son wants to know what value you would put on this card. And I'll message with them. I mean, I've messaged with people for hours, not even trying to buy a card from him. And that's just the friendship that you can make through collecting and through sports cards. Um, and we're going to offer different perspectives, uh, you know, talk about perspectives and talk to people of all different races, religions, uh, you know, genders, whatever it is. Uh, New York being one of the most diverse places in the country, there's a lot of different and diverse takes that we'll have on sports and different diverse people will have on the show. And, uh, you know, just to, just to keep having fun, have an outlet, have an escape, and hopefully make a little money in the process. Um, but, I mean, I know we're going to have a lot of fun with it. I hope episode one was fun for people who listened. I know we certainly always have fun talking about sports and getting on random topics. Um, and you know, and I used to work at ESPN, so I have a lot of stories from ESPN that connect to sports cards. Humble um, brag. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I like I say, you can pat yourself on the back once in a while. You know, no, I feel like I that's that's helping. I, I'm I'm your number one fan, Carmine. So I, I fully support Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, bro. So, um, like, uh, might as well say this now. Like Mike Breen told me. When I got to talk to him for half an hour, you know, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna mention this story. Oh, and, your boy uh, Mike, my my boy Mike. I do have his number in my phone, but I probably wouldn't be able to call it now. But when I started as an intern at ESPN, he said, "I said, Mike, you, Jeff Van Gundy, and Mark Jackson, you're always fooling around." I said, "How do you manage the time between talking about the game and talking about your personal stories with these two guys?" And he said, it always comes back to the game first. So for us, it'll always come back to the cards first. So we might get off on tangents. We might talk about, you know, personal stuff, which, you know, we're not afraid to address. We already talked about money. In the end, it always comes back to the cardboard. And I said, if the number one basketball announcer, you know, announcing like 15 NBA finals in a row is saying it's not about him, it's about the game. He must be right. So, you know, we'll always bring it back to the cards, but there's so many tangential relationships. We kind of bounced around in the first episode just off of excitement to give you guys a flavor. Good word right there. Thank you. Thank you, Teach. Thank you. So that's that's my take. But what do you think? What's your final elevator pitch to for people to keep watching? I think that was pretty perfectly said that at the end of the day, it's all about the cards and everything that comes with it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stories to tell. I'm in this very fortunate position in my life where between being a teacher, a soccer coach and a card collector, all my worlds are kind of intertwined. And with that are just a lot of fun stories. And I've found ways to connect with people through cards that I never thought I would. So we want to, we want to really, you know, attract a wide audience and of uh, people of all collectors. Like you said, the diversity is important to us. I, uh, I teach and I run a card club at my school, which is quite diverse. And um, that club is starting up soon. So we're definitely going to get into that. But come hear our stories, share with us, uh, interact. We'll definitely be up in the comments and just enjoy. And, you know, going back to what you said, let's just remember it's all about the cards. Yes, sir. All about the cards. And that is episode one of Crosstown Cardboard. Stay tuned for episode two. And thanks for watching.